Okay. Uh, so, am I audible, Harpy? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes. Yes, I can hear you. Yes. So, <clears throat> so basically, uh, so we actually explored uh, application scores on the card as the behavior scores are sort of thing from personal loan. And one very important characteristics of personal loan was that uh, personal loans were a uh, closed-end product, closed-end business product in the sense that they had a finite maturity time. Right. Given that they had a finite maturity time, so basically there were fixed installments which were given out or which were lent out, to the, uh, which were which the borrower be paid out to the time. So, however, most be it credit card, be it overdrafts, or be it personal loans, the basic characteristic behind all these products was that they were all unsecured lending products. Right. So they were unsecured retail lending. Products. And since they were unsecured lending products, therefore it was very important that uh, you know their risk, the derivative riskiness that these borrowers uh, that these products have was very high. And hence, you would see that these products have a, uh, they generally have a higher rate of interest, right? So that uh, so that the cost of the loan can be increased, and then. By, by keeping the credit, the rate of interest to be higher, they tend to you know, control the quality, quantity of the loan uh, taken out. And on the other hand, what they try to do is they also try to, you know, they also try to uh, control the quality of the credit by using these respective uh, strategies of acquisition behavior and stuff. So their entire idea is to ensure that the credit goes to the best possible people and the credit amount is also efficiently channelized to them. Now, today we start our discussion on secured lending products. So when I talk about secured lending product, it means that that the loan is given out against collateral. There is some kind of an asset which is kept back while giving out the amount of loan. So this is where the secured loan comes in. And within secured loan, the most important and the most widely known, or the, you know, the most widely discussed loan is the mortgages. Now, when I talk about mortgages, mortgages are nothing but uh, the home loans. Now, mortgages comprise of uh, Mortgage comprises of a very important part of the retail uh, sub portfolio, right? And the second type of loan, which falls under the other retail products, is the auto loans. Auto loans. So these are the three basic. Also, these are the two basic products that we discuss. But the basic idea behind this is that both of these products that we have or these products that we are talking about over here, right? So one very important characteristic is that for both the, for any secured product or any secured lending products, there is always this underlying asset which is kept as collateral. And therefore, the movement of this underlying asset is what determines the, you know, the riskiness associated with the loan. So the, the riskiness associated with the loan is not only explained through the behavior risk, but also through the, you know, the riskiness associated with the price of the asset. Now, the behavior risk always determines the probability of default site, the chances to default, and the recovery of the LGD, the loss given default, is uh, captured through movement in these uh, underlying asset prices. So, what is the difference between a secured, basic difference between a secured and an unsecured lending product? 
So a very deep, a very simple difference between a secured and an unsecured lending product that we have seen is that the secured lending product has a you know it has a asset against which it can be which against which it can be borrowed. So if the borrower is unable to pay back the loan, what the seller or I mean, what the lender would do is, is the lender would take the asset, send it up in the market and recover his amount. Now over here, to start off with the most important uh, secure product which is mortgages. So what is a mortgage? A mortgage is nothing but it's a simple home loan. So basically if I actually borrow a money, if I actually borrow money to buy a home, right, and I'm, I, I start paying it back in an installment, in installments I pay it out and the typical longevity of a home loan is around uh, 30 years, like 25 to 30 years. So when I do that, uh, the mortgage would actually give me an idea about the fact that, okay, this is how the things actually go on. Right. So, based on the mortgage side of things, uh, so I take the money, I, I borrow the money, I buy the house, and I start paying it back in installment. Now, so after paying the money for the first two years, I see that I am unable to maintain the loan. I cannot maintain the loan. I've lost my job, or uh, all my loans are such that I it, it, I find it very difficult under the stress situation to give my home loan EMI. So given that, so given that, given that the bank would take out my home loan, take out my home, it was, it's my home, they sell it off in the market and it would recover the remaining amount that I had and been unable to pay back and perhaps make a profit on that based on the housing prices at that point of time. Therefore, the extent of recovery that the person can make from uh, selling of my home is dependent on the amount of uh, the, or is dependent on the housing prices that are prevalent at that point of time, right? Therefore, the risk that the bank faces from that loan is not only from the behavior side, but it is also from the loss given before of the recovery of the collections side of things. So therefore, we need to compare and contrast. So we need we to look into not only the behaviorist or the factors that affect the behaviorist, but also we need to look into the factors which affect the underlying housing prices. Now, if you think about the factor of housing prices, right? Housing prices are not just determined like that. There are law, there are factors which drive the housing prices and mostly the housing prices are not only just driven by, driven by simple demand supply kind of an equation, but it also has macroeconomic factors playing a very important role in it. So how does that happen? Right, to understand that what can actually happen during uh, to housing prices and how is it that macroeconomic factors can impact housing prices, right? So we need to talk about, so the best possible example that we can see or we can study to analyze the impact of macroeconomic factor on housing prices is the housing crisis that we recently saw in the year 2007-8 in the US and in different parts of UK. So it was the housing crisis. And how did all the macroeconomic factors impact the housing prices in US at that point of time? So to understand how macroeconomic factors can impact housing prices, so what we need to do is we just need to go back to the period of, uh, we just need to go back uh, some, to the uh, beginning of 2001. Just a second. Hello. 
Hello. Hello. Hello. Hello. Okay, so as I was saying, to understand the impact that macroeconomic factors can have on the housing prices, let us just go back to the year 2001, right? So what did what had happened in the US during 2001? How did it actually work? So the first thing that happened is that, you know, the first thing that happened is the macroeconomic scenarios were so U.S. had just come out of the U.S. Uh, the, tech, the technology bubble burst in the year 2000. Now following that technology bubble burst in 2000, the next thing that happened to U.S. in 2001 was uh, the, the terror attacks, right? Now following these two events, the confidence on the U.S. economy of the global confidence on the US economy had been very low for the global world, I mean for the global economy. Now once this was done, um, the economy, the US economy had entered into a recession. Now this recession which had come out was, uh, I mean resulted in a lack of customer spending, resulting in, you know, retraction of uh, productive capacity in the economy resulting in huge volume of unemployment and with this when unemployment actually happens there are loads of people who are getting laid off and when people get laid off people have a very low chances or have they have low purchasing uh, capacity and hence people do not generally think about investing into assets like real estate and other such assets. That is the reason why during downturn, the real estate prices tend to fall down. They tend to slide down during these downturn periods. Now, in US, what had happened was from 2000, right up to 2000 to, 2000, to the beginning of 2003, the economy had been facing a recession. And as a strategy to come out of this recession, the then government decided and the then government in collaboration with the uh, Federal Reserve at that point of time decided that to come out of recession, what they would do is they would increase consumption spending. So the way it would ideally work is when consumption spending boosts up, the, cons the, cons the consumer houses, they start uploading their inventories. And as their inventories get offloaded, they would, they would start producing more. And as the production starts, the demand for labor would begin, the employment would increase, the unemployment would reduce, the average income would increase, and the second and the third round of demands would cause further increase in production. And hence, it would lead to a gradual boom, right? So basically the idea is, I buy goods and the person who's selling the good runs out of the goods, he starts producing more goods. To buy that, produce that more goods, you require more people, 
Now, as more people work, their income increases. And when their income increases, they also go along and demand the goods along with me. Therefore, the overall demand increases. And this increases in circles or in cycles or in several rounds, leading to a multiple round of increase in the demand. Right? And gradually an economy gradually dragged out of the recessionary tendency. However, the biggest challenge over here is to initiate this cycle. So once the cycle is initiated, then there is no problem. Then the rounds of uh, changes, they start happening. But the first and the most important channel over here is to understand that how is it that this first chain needs to be done or the chain needs to get initiated. So what happened was, what the Federal Reserve did was, they had cut down the rates of interest to as low as 1% in the economy during 2002-2003. And it was the end of 2001, beginning of 2002. So towards the end of 2002, the consumption expenditure had increased. Now, always remember that when an economy expands, right, and uh, there is a cut in the rate of interest, when the demand increases, the first part where the credit demand, the demand for credit increases in a bank is your retail portfolio. Because when people see that the rates of interest are low, the first thing they rush to do is they rush to buy real estate. Now, why do they buy real estate? The reason behind this is that if real estate uh, you know that the prices of real estate would actually increase over a period of time. So if you are buying a house today for rupees 100, then over a given period of time, so over a period of 15 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line, or 35 years down the line, you will be able to sell it for rupees 1000, if not more. Right? So you'll always make a profit because the demand per housing will increase but the supply cannot increase really uh, in relation to that because the size of the land is more or less fixed. Therefore, given that population increases at a geometric progression, there would be always a shortage of houses and hence an excess demand for housing, which will draw the price of the housing up. And when the economy expands and when the economy grows with an increase in income, people would always try to buy and add it or would you try to run for houses. This is the precise reason as to why in Mumbai the real estate prices are so high whereas in Calcutta they are relatively less because in Mumbai, Mumbai being the financial capital or for that matter in India, Gurgaon being a capital financial major would have a lot of opportunities over there and people are earning lots. And they are willing to go for their own houses. They're trying to buy their own houses, apartments, flats, etc. And the demand for house is always in excess compared to its supply. So in Gurgaon, DLF cannot build houses proportionately. So therefore, the price of the houses, or the, or the property prices, be it in Mumbai or be it in Gurgaon, are really very high. On the other hand, the second part of the story is that that when you get to see this, right, so when you, um, when you get to see this, you know that as housing prices increase, right, so housing prices would always increase. But just imagine the case that in addition to this requirement, in addition to this excess demand for housing, the rates of interest in home loans are cut down to as 1 and 1%. One so what will happen? The housing prices will increase much more than required. So much more than the average excess demand, the excess demand will increase because now there will be more and more people willing to buy houses. Now the moment this is done, right, your housing prices will accelerate and there will be more and more people who are willing to buy the houses. And hence this was the reason as to why housing prices started accelerating exponentially from 
it was the you know the beginning of 2003 in US now added to this what the US guys did was they had created certain other innovations in the housing process so one thing that they, they did was they had introduced the subprime loans now in the subprime loan they were actually giving out loans to people who could not even afford to pay back the loan if the loans were given at a market rate of interest. So relevant to the market rate of interest, they were being given just at a small, very small rate of interest with some special facility, they were just given the loan because they did not have the capacity to just pay back the loans. So now the question that came out was, why were the bankers giving out the loans to these people? Now, one, one reason at the back of the mind that they had was they were trying to expand the economy right so they were trying to expand the demand in the economy that's one the second is that they were trying to they, they had the back of the mind the housing prices are increasing exponentially and even if these guys are unable to pay back the money we would actually sell off the house in the future and we would get back our money so that was the second reason that they had Therefore, the next part that would happen is that housing prices started accelerating further and more and more loans were given to these people. Now, what had happened over here? So since there was no you know, control on the quality of the credit, the portfolios became inherently toxic. And the only assumption that these lenders had was that housing prices would continue to increase. And it did continue to increase over a period of time. And that is where the second round of things started happening. As these people saw, as the subprime borrower, as in any of these borrowers, they saw that the housing prices are increasing. And, and they hold a huge amount of purchasing power in terms of their ownership of the house. These borrowers, they went out to... Uh, these borrowers, they went out and what they did was they had, uh, you know, these borrowers, they went out and they refinanced their house. So against the increased valuation of their house, they took up a loan. That is, say for example, in the last, last year, I bought my house and it was worth, say, one lakh. Now, after, uh, after some one and a half years, I see that my house is worth 7 lakhs. So now I have borrowing capacity by monetizing my house worth 3 lakhs. So I go and I refinance my home with 3 lakhs. Now the entire 7 lakh of money is actually moved out. Right? So now the bank gives me the additional 3 lakh. I take that money, I spread it off, I enjoy my holiday and my consumption is my money. And this continues for good years. Right. Towards the beginning of 2007, people started realizing that they were actually overpaying for the houses. That is, the year they started realizing that the real estate property was, uh, you know, real estate property was overpriced. And given that the real estate properties were overpriced, there was a market correction which had happened. And people started booking, uh, cancelling a lot of their bookings, right? And immediately the housing prices fell. Now the moment the housing prices plunged and it moved towards the market correction, obviously the you know there was a shift in the demand. The demand shrank, and what happened was suddenly the rate of interest reverted back to the market rate, and the banks realized that they had actually lent out. 7 lakhs for a house which originally would have costed 3 lakhs as per the market price. So with a lot of innovations and strategies, uh, this entire part, you know, this housing prices, they were artificially inflated. And given that they were inflated, there were inflated housing prices, the challenge that the banks faced was a sure recovery challenge. That is, for a house of 3 lakhs, they had already lent out 7 lakhs. So therefore they would, by selling the house, even if they recover the money by selling the house, 
they would make a loss of 4 lakhs. So that implied that they could not sell out the house at that point of time. So they had to wait to sell off the house. Right? So they had to really wait before selling off the house and there was a lock-in period. And hence there was a lock-in period. Therefore the banks could not immediately sell it up and they started earning huge amount of losses where, where they could have faced the chances of collapsing as well. In order to prevent these chances of collapse, etc., what was done was the government stepped in and bailout was done. Now, in between this bailout and the collapse, there was another event where the investor, investment banks had played a role, right? So I'm not going into that part right now because we don't need to understand that. So the entire idea behind this discussion was that when macroeconomic factors come in together to play, right, the most sensitive part which gets affected is the housing. So the housing seg segment gets impacted the moment this actually happens, right? So this housing crisis, the way it happens. Right. So therefore, if a, so, a lot of lessons were actually learned from the housing crisis. That housing prices are number one is affected by underlying macroeconomic movements. Number one, and number two is the banks became very conscious about the fact that the entire amount of the housing prices or the market price of the house should not be given out as loan. So the loan must be given after keeping a buffer so that if there are adjustments of housing prices, the bank still has enough room to make a profit. And that is where the concept of this loan to value ratio came. It is not that there was a very new enlightenment of the loan to value ratio. Right. It was not that there was a new enlightenment, but it was that this loan to value ratio concept was taken very seriously after the housing crisis happened right and this housing bubble that it burst and the economy again entered the u.s economy again entered into a recession so after this crisis uh, in one of the indian journals right so uh, the economic and political weekly there was a uh, you know there was a remark made by an economist who was that wall street never learns from its experiences so they create one bubble to get out from another. So this is what uh, was the entire idea. So after the housing crisis had happened, right, and there was a lot of discussion on these uh, the impact of housing crisis. Also, even before housing crisis, the housing crisis had occurred, but at the when the housing crisis was at its peak, there were economists who were actually giving warning signals like Robert Schiller of Yale University, Kenneth Rogoff of Harvard University, uh, our Dr. Aguram Rajan when he wrote his famous book, The Fault Lines. So these, in all these literature, if you actually see, you see that they talk about the sensitivity of real estate businesses to uh, the macroeconomic situations. And therefore, this is this underlying asset price that needs to be monitored very accurately or needs to be monitored very sensitively so that to ensure that a proper recovery process can initiate once a downturn is actually observed. Right? So, <clears throat> so uh, if your housing prices are not well monitored and there is a sudden crash in your housing prices, there is a sudden fall in the housing demand, your housing prices crash, then your NGD becomes very questionable. You are unable to recover money from the loss and you end up having a larger amount of loss. So, so one very important part over here is that we not only uh, while giving out mortgages or you know mortgage loans, it is not only about the obligor's behavior, but it is also about the underlying uh, asset or the impact of the underlying asset on the default rate and it shows that if there is a crash in the underlying asset prices there can be 
sudden increase in the portfolio and means the expected loss of the portfolio can increase over time. So over here we will first of all uh, before moving into this underlying asset price uh, before moving to the obligate side of things we will move into the obligate side but let us first talk about the underlying asset price. So this under the impact of this underlying asset price is really very important right. And we need to understand that how is it that an underlying asset price can be, uh, you know, kind of underlying asset can be actually examined. How is it that we can actually uh, try to analyze the un uh, un an underlying asset price? How is it that we could do about it? Or what is it that we could actually do about it? So we'll first of all talk about the underlying asset prices. Uh, on online mortgage prices, what are the factors which affect mortgages as a mortgage price in the economy? And from there, we'll talk about the obligatory specific factors, right? So, up to this point, is it clear to you, Harpreet? Any questions that you might have? No, no questions. It okay. is clear. Okay, so uh, I would suggest, uh, if possible, uh, just read out, uh, just as an added reading, uh, read out uh, the chapter one of fault lines by Dr. R. Raghuram Raju. The first chapter it lays uh, out the framework, not the entire part of the first chapter, it's just the first three, four pages of the first chapter, which lays out, you know, an entire framework about, uh, what should I say, well, an entire framework about uh, this what you know an entire framework as to how this price is and how did it can you can you just ta type that uh, whatever yeah. you said so yeah. that i can i can note it down yeah i'll type so the book's name is fault lines this is a wonderful book fault lines written by dr r Raghuram Raju. Okay. Now, one thing you will see if you read is that he's a very sarcastic writer, right? So, there are cases where mm -hmm. we come across very funny sarcasm, where which he has made of the Federal Reserve of Alvin Greenspan, the then federal government, right? And in fact, how is it that he played a role in fostering in all these bubbles? And in case of the housing crisis, uh, when the investment banks came in, the impact of the crisis, which was initially limited to U.S., spread across to the world. So that's one, and you need to read the chapter one. Read chapter one, or just I don't remember this. It's uh, chapter one and the introduction. Okay. introduction. So do you have that book? Or I will I have to uh, get it online? I think you can get this book online. I mean, I had bought the book, okay. but I believe the chapters are available. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you do not find it, just tell me. When I get back to Calcutta, I will uh, take the picture of the pages and I'll move it. Okay. I'll sure. get it to watch. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. Great. Now, having said this, uh, the next part that we'll talk about, we'll start talking about over here is, you know, the, so how would an underlying asset price look like? So, or how does, how can I assess or uh, how is it that the movements in an underlying asset price is uh, represented? So theoretically, and also how is it, how is it that it is actually estimated? So I'll just talk about the overview of it, right? So one part that is obviously, so to assess the housing, uh, to assess the movements in underlying asset price, we use uh, the Martin's 1976 model. We use the Martin's model.
models model, right? And this models model was in the year 1976. What Martel's model 1976 says is that that the average movements in the underlying asset price is, uh, or rather the movements in an underlying asset price is determined by two factors. One is your, uh, you know, one is the average movements or average prices, and the second is the variance. It's the overall, uh, what should I say? The overall variance in the housing prices. Now, what if that there is a shock? So, how would an asset price react to it if there is a shock, and how is it that we can estimate such a shock? So, that is where this entire story comes in. So, basically, what I'll be talking about next is an extension of the original Martin model, 1976 model. Right, I'm not going into very, uh, you know, mathematical descriptions or, you know, kind of uh, mathematical portions, but I'll just give you a brief idea about. It. So over here, what it says is that, so let PT or uh, PT be the price that the housing price takes at time period T. So the percentage change in price, uh, PT by PT. Is so this is a percentage change in price. Now, why is this a percentage? Now, DPT, when I say DPT, what I mean is a uh, change in the price in a continuous time frame, right? So, a per change in price divided by the price is the percentage change. Now, this what are the factors which determine this percentage change in the price? So, over here, uh, it is determined by the mean asset price, right? The mean asset price into the total time period change. So the mean asset price over the change in the period. And it is more or less assumed that the price is, or the mean is more or less average about the fluctuations, right? Now, and the second half, there is a, a, a standard deviation or a sigma, sigma t. So this is nothing but this is the uh, standard deviation or the a variation about the mean asset price. Now, but the sigma that I have over here is a constant value, but the sigma doesn't change, right? So in order to ensure that there is a movement around the sigma, so basically the variation differs from time to time, we incorporate something called a Brownian motion variable or a Weiner variable, D, W. What does sigma represent? I'll, I'll, I'll show you what sigma represents. So what sigma represents is this. Say you have a graph over here. So over here, what you have is time. And over here, what you have is price. Right? Now, your housing prices are uh, moving like this. The housing prices are moving like this, right? So what I do is I take this up and I put a straight line. So the straight line is, you know, 
the mean price is the mean housing price is the mean housing price now this green line that you can see over here this green line is the mu t is the mu t right and the part over here is so this part or uh, say so over here you can see that there is a deviation from the average value right so there is a deviation about the average value so this deviation about the average value is called your standard deviation and the standard deviation gives us an idea about the overall fluctuation that uh, the that the data set shows respective to the mean value so the standard deviation is the one right so the standard deviation is the <coughs> uh, what should i say the standard deviation is the value that i have over here right so when i talk about standard deviation so standard deviation is nothing but uh, it is the average deviation or the overall deviation about the central uh, measure about the mean right so sigma t uh, shows this respective deviation that the data has from the central or the mean value right clear on this concept okay but i still don't understand the sigma t and tw uh, no no tw i'll come to it later are you clear on the okay. concept of standard deviation yes yeah. Yes, it means the deviation from the mean. It means the average so deviation that, from the mean, right? So basically, okay, yes. what what will happen is, I'll just go to the next. Page. Say there is housing prices recorded at different time points. Okay. so i'll go to this so there is this time point t and at each time point t there is a probability t i mean there is a price p right so say in the first period the time uh, point the prices the average housing price say is the housing price index shows the houses to the price is 20k or the values are all recorded in thousands therefore i am not just writing it it's in 20 20000 the second day the price is 28000 i mean not second day but second month the third month or third time point the housing price is Say twenty nine thousand dollars. Then the fourth month, it is thirty thousand dollars. The fifth month, it is twenty seven thousand dollars. So what you can see is that there is a average, there is a fluctuation. So if I actually plot the data, right? If I actually plot the data point. i will get to see that that there is a different kind of a movement you know so so the deviation is not always constant so this is for the first say 5 10 months so this is for the first 5 months now in the next 5 months what we'll get to see is that there is other kind of uh, there is another kind of movement so if i plot the standard if you look at the standard deviation about the average value this stand there would be variation in the standard deviation so before i move into talking about the variation and the randomness just let me talk about the concept of standard deviation first let me introduce this basic concept 
So I, I told you that. So now from this value, we can obviously compute a mean. So what is the mean in this data set? The mean is nothing but 20 plus 28 plus 29 plus 30 plus 37. So that is 48. 48 plus 30 is 78. 78 plus 30 is 108 minus 1 is 107. 107 plus 27 is 134. Right? So just let me make it 135. 135 divided by 5. So the average housing price that I have over here is 27. Right? Now you would see that from each of these observations differs from 27. So each of these are the average value lies around over here. Right? No, sorry. The average value lies somewhere here. So there is a deviation of each of the observation from the average value. So if I actually plot the graph now, you will see that the graph comes out something like this. Right. The square root of the variance is your standard deviation. So I'll have this something like this. So if I draw this line, if I draw a straight line from here, right, what I'll have is the variance. So over here, the idea over here is xi minus x bar. So I need to know that how does this observation differ. So if I call this xi, each of the data points, and the mean is my mu, then is xi minus mu. So this is 27 minus, 20 minus 27, so which is minus 7. 28 minus 27 is 1, 29 minus 27 is 2, 30 minus 27 is 3, and 28 minus 27 again is 1. Now, obviously, it is uh, more it, now whenever we are doing statistical analysis, it is very important to do away with the impact of the signs because signs do not have any quantitative impact. What it only means is it has a directional impact. It tries to say that uh, that xi minus mu is minus 7 means that the observed value at that point of time. 7 units lower than the average mean, right? Lower, lower the average. So we, need, we don't need to uh, work with the signs as such. So what we'll do is we will square away with the signs. Or we'll remove the signs. And how do you remove the signs? You remove the signs by squaring them. Forty nine, one, four, nine, and one. So, like uh, forty one, fifty, fifty four, so fifty four, and then sixty four, sixty three, one, sixty four. So, it's like sixty four divided by five is your. sigma square or your variance and the root over of 64.5 is your sigma or your standard deviation. You can see that the standard deviation gives us an idea about the overall behavior of the borrower. Right? I mean, the overall, it, it gives us an idea about the overall variation in the behavior of the asset class, right?
So now is the ID of sigma clear to you? Great. Great. So over here, now if you think about this, that this sigma that I have over here, the sigma does not change very quickly. I mean, I mean, this, this doesn't remain constant over time. Right? It is not always that the sigma will be root over 64.5 because since macroeconomic factors are a factor, I mean, since, uh, you know, housing prices related to macroeconomic factors, as there are changes and as events happen, the macroeconomic prices also start shifting. Right. So this is the place where, or this is uh, the part where we talk about where we talk about this Weiner motion, Weiner process, or you know the random, the Brownian motion. So the Weiner process, this variable, Weiner variable. So we'll talk about Weiner variables later when we start talking more about these values, right? So when I talk about Weiner variables, now these Weiner variables represent a Brownian motion, and they have a very specific statistical description. They have a very very specific statistical part. So, so what this Wino process talks about is it talks about introducing a randomness to the overall behavior of this uh, standard deviation. So, this Wino process is used to bring about these fluctuations in the standard deviation. The standard deviation here, right, and the the deviation here is not the same, right. So, there is always a variation in the in the deviation during a neighborhood of time say there is a weekly variance in the variance of the values so therefore that is used to bring about a randomness in the variation value so what it says is that the asset prices or the percentage change in the asset price is determined by two factors one is the mean or the mean asset price mean price of the housing and the fluctuations in the variance that the housing prices have so basically if your variance is gradually increasing over time your housing prices will also increase but subject to a market correction after a point of time where your housing prices would suddenly fall and it is that fall where the crash actually occurs so basically when there is an asset price movement which is going on and when your asset is driven by an underlying asset price it is very important to monitor that how likely are the asset prices to crash in the next uh, 12 months, in the next 12 months, or over a forward-looking period? So while I am, you know, trying to predict the probability of a borrower to default in the next 12 months, what I'm also trying to do is I also need to assess what are the chances of the borrower to default, as well as what are the chances of uh, this thing to happen. You know, what are the chances of um, like a borrower to default as well as what are the chances of the underlying asset prices to crash right so this is something that we need to uh, take care of now having said that so let's uh, now move uh, so when we move into the statistical portions over there we would uh, be talking about these concepts in more detail when we talk about distribution talk about descriptive measures so that is where this entire part would be coming together. Now, uh, so now let's try and understand uh, the next part or the, or the next side of the study. That how are the obligor risks assessed, right? So how are the uh, origination risks? What are the important factors that we need to look into? Why? Assessing the home loan while assessing the home prices. I mean, while mm -hmm. assessing. So, like, yeah. Will you be able to finish that in in the next 10, 10 15 minutes? The new topic, obligor no, uh, risk. No, it will take some time. Okay, okay so then let's okay. uh, stop here. Let's stop. Mm -hmm. here. Okay. We'll start off with this part of discussion uh, on Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. So then we are having the next class. Okay. Yes. Right. Uh, yes. Thank you. Today I send out all your recordings and um, board works. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye.